So our first speaker is Dale Smith, talking about renovation. Dale, do you have any pictures of yourself in Beijing? <laughs> you got the weird I don't know how many days they wore this shirt. On, not the <laughs> <laughs> So Bowling Green is located in northwest Ohio on the drained black swamp. Um, <laughs> and the planetarium and on the rooftop, the observatory are part of the physical sciences laboratory building which is this brick box. So there's two interesting features architecturally of the two domes. So after 30 years as a traditional planetarium, we're now a mixed traditional um, 21st century full dome. We were opened in 1984, a 40-foot dome, 118 seats. That's a bigger dome size than a city as small as Bowling Green justifies, but it's also a BGSU astronomy classroom, and that's what dictated of the number of seats and therefore the, of the diameter. We serve as, um, as a classroom for all of the intro astronomy classes at BGSU, um, and we do public, um, so, so we meaning, there are six astronomers at BG, we all teach the intro classes, and then I do public shows um, and um, school groups. The, um, the, the, the equipment decisions for the original installation were all made before I arrived, um, and they were excellent. Um, Decisions, okay. I was hired there. They needed somebody with a PhD and in astronomy or physics and planetarium experience. I had taught an astronomy class in the 30 foot planetarium at Bellevue Community College in Seattle, and that qualified me for, for the, the job. Little did they know. <laughs> um, but the original equipment um, was way ahead of its time and included from commercial electronics an OmniQ slide automation system that I think was years ahead of the curve, and so we were in this very comfortable position for a long time. Controls of, in an automated way, slide special effects. Um, the, there was the Minolta star projector, still is, um, and then we added video in 1994. We got the funding in 92, was good for 20, two years. We waited 23 months. Um, in the reasoning is straightforward. Prices went down, equipment got, and then we purchased, and we were basically with this configuration for the next 20 years um, or so. Gradually, I decided to go full dome. It took a long time um, for me to make that decision. Uh, we've kept the Minolda, we've kept, we've kept everything, okay, the Minolda and the slide automation system. Uh, when full dome appeared around 2000, I was not very impressed, but I saw conferences where movies, like all of us, said, I, want, I don't want to just push a button. I want to be a teacher. It's my classroom. I want to be an educator. Um, there were and I've seen lots of demos at conferences. Two were critical in shaping my thinking. Um, one was at the WAC conference, Western Alliance in Salt Lake in 2003, um, when Kevin Scott, who had been at the Renaissance Center in Tennessee, was um, had at that point moved um, to work for ENS, was doing a demo of teaching vignettes you could do with full dome, and that opened my eyes. Okay, I can use this to teach. I'm not just going to be a, um, be a movie projectionist. And then in um, 2009, um, Spitz with David Bradstreet and Scott Hawkins did a demonstration at Shaker Heights in Cleveland a couple hours. I went over to that and saw Dave Bradstreet's incredible um, demos, and they said, uh, and that guided me along the way in choosing um, to go with Spitz. Um, as we all know, there's a lot of excellent choices out there. We all have real tough choices to make. I thought that the Spitz side dome system was the best match for us, given uh, we were an educational institution doing classes, um, schools, and public shows. Um, our neighbor up the road, Toledo, had put in side dome XD a couple of years before. They were the first XD systems. So we followed them and uh, were the first cove-mounted system. So, so I thought for our needs and different ones, we would make different choices. But I thought for our needs, the side dome was um, the best match. <clears throat> okay, funding. Um, those of you who know me know that among my many weaknesses is an aversion to anything having to get money. <laughs> um, and once they decided the side dome and well, knew the price for that, knew the price for seats and so forth, that added up to about 425000 They rounded it up to five hundred, dollars um, and then had a meeting in early fall of 2011, a half hour uninterrupted <clears throat> with the dean and provost together wow. in the planetarium lobby. And 
made the case, which took half an hour to make it do it in 30 seconds here. We have aging equipment at some point. It's going to break down. We're going to roll over the cliff without warning and be shut down. At the same time, full dome has become mature. It's a time of opportunity, risk and opportunity together. I need $500,000 to do it right. They never challenged me on the justification or the budget, either one. 11 months later, I almost said 11 years. 11 months later, um, in August of 2012, they put the money up. Half from the dean, half from the provost. Um, and the, the person I'm most grateful to is the dean. It's, I think 250000 from the provost is not a lot. 250 from the dean is a lot of money. And the dean, I think, took the lead, went to the provost, said, I'll put up 250 can you match it? So we were funded internally. And I think almost all of the full domes in Ohio um, have been at educational places have been funded either internally or through alums. So we were, um, you know, in, um, in that Toledo was funded internally um, as well. So we, it was a two-year uh, process. In the summer of 2013, we did the infrastructure preparation. And then this past summer, had the side dome put in. Since we're in the academic year schedule, summers when we have the block of time. Our first step was to strip out the old seats after 30 years um, and the carpet back to the concrete pad it last seen in 1983. We needed to put a lift on the Minolta. We are in the drain black swamp of Northwest Ohio, so not a prayer to have an elevator pit. Our elevator pit is never flooded because we don't have one. <laughs> the building's elevator pit is flooded uh, four, four times in the, uh, the 30 years the building has been there. So we had to, uh, but we needed to lower the Minolta. Of the side was going to go on a, um, a floor kiosk. We would have, would have had horrendous shattering in the back by lowering the Minolta as near to the floor as possible. We could reduce that. And so we sliced off the legs. Here are the legs. This is too small to read, but it says free after 30 years. And uh, we contracted with Ash to put a lift system in. Um, so that was the first step that was um, done. Then we had the dome repainted, um, okay, down from 62 to 53 percent of the AstroTech dome, so we had them do the repainting, um, and the dome looked like new by the time they were, um, were done. We then, um, after that, had the new carpet put in, new seats put in. We were told by the architect's office the carpet had to have orange and brown in, that's BJSU colors. Um, <laughs> long story. Um, we got nice black carpet <laughs> and nice blue seats. Um, we, it was a very interesting process working with the capital planning and design, I have to say this carefully, design and construction offices. Sometimes we use a different word from construction. Um, and it was alternately helpful and, um, and difficult. Um, I'll just leave it at um, that. So summer 2013, the infrastructure was done this past summer 2014. Um, we put the side dome in along the way. Um, Joyce Town had emailed me, would you be interested in a cove-mounted side dome? And I said, yes. Um, that solves two problems. It gets rid of any shadowing. It gets rid of beverage spills and fingerprints since college students can't read the no beverage signs. So um, Spitz made an on-site visit. In May, we ran strings across to determine we would clear the lower Penalta. Um, they came back in May, um, beginning of summer, did the installation. We were the first uh, cove mounted side dome, so it took some extra steps, extra care um, along the way. One, uh, and so here's a picture in the north of the, of the north projector. And there, uh, there's two projectors they shoot across like that. Um, and so this is the one in the north side of the room that shoots to the south. And there's a similar one. In the, the south, one, um, and it's all working. <laughs> and uh, we ran into a problem with the lift system. It failed. Um, Ash came back. The lift system is taken out. And there's a new one being designed, and we'll have that um, in due course. And, and so we're now using side dome in um, classes, in public shows, in school groups. And this is a picture of a wide angle picture of the, of the side dome console, the, the old Minolta console, and. Um, a Martian landscape. Um, it's, for somebody who is a traditionalist, it's been a very interesting um, and energizing learning process um, going from traditional to full dome. So we're using all these modes and are in the process of trying to, over the next two or three years, program in most of our legacy shows um, into this high dome. And I'll talk about that in a year or two when I have some more experience. 
I probably used my time up, so um, we have time for a question. But yeah. you're still using the moon all time, it's the first two minutes. Um, you can use it for stories when you want that kind my, of uh, My intention has been to use the Minolta for the Star Talk before the shows and the Side Dome during the shows. Hmm. What's happening with the, with the Minolta sitting there on, on the wooden blocks, I'm using, is ba right now it's the museum piece. <laughs> and so we're using Side Dome for everything. Once we have the, the new lift system in, then I'll reappraise where I need to go. But that's, my thinking is confused. Either confused or transitioning right now. Take your choice of the, the bird. For me too. Yeah. How did you how did you actually justify your having a you know to the <coughs> provost you're actually getting a side job while keeping the Minolta? Uh, because all the all the graphics capability <coughs> okay. is is the short answer. Yeah. How do you integrate it with the rest of the university? How do you get the rest of the university to kind of buy into? Okay, the, uh, the planetarium was justified initially as a classroom. And so that's the continuing justification for it. And I've been there, and I've, I've been the only, best, worst, only planetarium director they've had. Um, <laughs> and so just with the longevity, there's a, I guess I've developed a certain amount of credibility. With um, my intention over time is now to reach out to, to related departments like geology, digital arts. That's I'm not doing that right now, but that's that's um, in the plans. And you have an impressive yeah, there's a um, rooftop observatory, um, half-meter telescope. How many K-12 groups do you have? Uh, Seventeen. Seventeen. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And I won't go through the details of how by default I got the position, but the bottom line is that from 1969, with one year uh, exception going back to grad school after two years, uh, I was the uh, planetarium director as a release time till 2003, 33 years. And when I came, I was half-time teaching half-time planetarium. And uh, after one year, they needed, besides the two lab sections for the course, they needed a third one. So it went two-thirds, one-third. After the second year, we needed a fourth lab section to go to 96 students, 72, or 48, 72, 96. Uh, so three-quarter, one-quarter. Well, then the planetarium, the public was happy, the teachers were happy, the scout leaders were happy. Uh, my chair goes to the dean and says, let's go back the other way a little. We can't do that. So it was always three-quarter, one-quarter. And so I did that for 33 years, 33 out of 34 years from 69 to 2003. Uh, I retired from teaching, took state retirement at 59 years old in 2003. Uh, they promised me the planetarium for three years at quarter time. So between state retirement and uh, 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 quarter time, I made the same without having whining students. You gave me a B when I deserved an A, whatever. Uh, the bottom line is Gordon Stewart volunteered for me for about five years, and he came to a few meetings. Uh, uh, they started pulling, because he was academic staff, quarter time, not faculty or lease position, uh, the uh, salary funding started getting shrink, shrinking and disappearing, trying to make, you, make yourself supporting like the parking lots. So um, Gordon made the mistake of, he was a trained engineer, he made the mistake of going over the head of the interim dean and coming down, and that just stirred up the hornet's nest. He was gone. And so at that point, they got someone from the department, Steve Verall, physics uh, uh, teacher, who uh, he had an interest in astronomy and taught both physics and astronomy labs, but uh, he, the plan here was forced on him. Number one, he did away with public school shows and uh, laser light shows. They're, they're not laser shows, but lasers for a song or two for rock music. And bottom line is, he was not dedicated like I was. He ran the business down, uh, not being uh, uh, no salary and uh, not dedicated. So when I came back, I retired, took a year to sell our house, moved to Florida where I grew up, the Tampa St. Pete area, came back to La Crosse after three years. It wasn't like going to a strange place, but the business was run down. Uh, the income was down, the numbers were down, et cetera. So when I came back, there was a presentation. Uh, I have two previous papers on this that are listed uh, early on in my uh, handout. Uh, 2012, two years ago, I presented a talk on New Cali Hall on UW-La Crosse campus. That's in the proceedings for that year, pages uh, 58 and 60. Uh, last year I did uh, fundraising for the UW La Crosse Planetarium, pages 21, 22 of last year's proceedings. So I won't give you the background there, you can look them up. There is a link there to the original floor plan. Uh, when I came back, they're talking about a new building. And they were gonna do it in two phases. Phase one, where our parking lot is, was gonna be $80 million. The most expensive building on campus before that was 65 million for a classroom building. Uh, that was phase one, our parking lot. It was going to be over 90% lab classroom and research space. Our department has 160 majors. We have 28 average graduates a year of the last five years. We're number two in the uh, states versus uh, Naval Academy of undergraduate degree granting. No advanced, we're very, a few master's degrees at the university, but the bottom line is we're considered a bachelor's university. So we have uh, 28 graduates a year. They hire faculty, they don't have office space, much less research space. So the phase one, 80 million where the parking lot is, that's in the planning, final planning process now, you know, is on schedule time-wise and money-wise for 80 million for opening in fall of 2018. And so we're in the final phases of planning for that. We've had two, phase two where the planetarium is in the existing building, uh, the decision was to raise the building, gut or raise, but they're gonna raise it it was initially 60 million with gutting, 55 million with raising. That has now slipped to 50, and a few thousand square feet from phase one has been kicked into phase two because they've run into, we got so many square feet, but the cost per square foot has gone up since the public presentation in 2011. Make a long story short, there we've had three meetings, uh, one late summer, one early fall, and uh, a second follow-up with each department, with the architects, the final architects. And uh, the first meeting was nothing about priorities, what's going to get done or not get done. They were more concerned with phase one, but they took anything about everything. My concerns were uh, you got to have light leaks, you need a dark adaptation area, you need uh, uh, 
uh, fourth, we're now in the basement first floor. We're going to the fourth floor, top floor with part of the dome out of the roof. You've got to be perfectly weather sealed. So light leaking, special purpose room, et cetera. I tried to get all that. I did that originally, but trying to make sure they know every step along the way. So the, they had the first meeting there. Our department had grown larger than we thought it would, projected from the time the first blueprints were initially made up. Uh, there was a second meeting that said, what do you absolutely not have to have? Our department didn't have much. We had two student organizations that each had a little room, and they said they could meet in one room. Other departments compromised, combined, and or gave up space. So originally, the phase one, 200,000 square feet. After the first meeting, it was almost 210. After the second meeting, 190 plus, because they had to, because the cost had gone up per square foot. So the problem there is that, number one, a few thousand square feet from phase one is now going to be on phase two instead. That was non-essential of being in phase one. Uh, they had the public, the open meeting after the two meetings with the departments, and the, there I asked the question, time frame and finances for phase one, everything's cool. We're planning this school year next. We will build uh, 16 and 17 school years open for fall of 18. 80 million, done deal. Phase two, I cannot give you a firm money amount. That's changing by the moment, and I cannot give you an opening date. Uh, so it's quicksand. The other problem is I had a former student uh, wanted to give money. He started out with 10000 a year for five years. When it got down to the nitty-gritty, the, the vice chancellor for advancement halftime, foundation halftime guy says, uh, we can't guarantee you, number one, there's going to be a phase two, number two, that there will be a planetarium in it. So he says, I'll go to 20 times five if you'll tell me there will be. He says, I can't tell you that. So he is on, he's, he's not pouring money into a black hole. He is on the back seat now. And so we are at a turning point, both uh, in terms of number one, what's going to be phase two. Well, they're starting to call it phase never. So I hope jokingly, but I don't. I I, I really don't know. So there's there's my background and the history, and uh, I, it's good to see some success stories. You know where we are today. Uh, Ron telling us it looked bad, and then it looked <laughs> unbelievable. And Dale with his. Uh, how do you get that much money out of a dean and a provost? He, he did it. He's an amazing man. And I, I'm a, uh, in the same sort of situation that it's a political game. And I, I'm just let me teach, I used to say, when they came up with assessment and things like that. That uh, just uh, uh, we, were general, we were basic studies when I started. All students had to have three science courses, two in a sequence and one other. Uh, in early 90s, they went to general education, two lab sciences. So no sequence was good anymore. And the two, two buzzwords, two buzz things, number one, critical thinking, number two, student involvement in the learning process. And it had some good things, but when you do assessment, what, what do you want to accomplish? How are you going to do it? How do you prove that you do it? You can go through two or three iterations, and you've made some changes and modified and adapted, but by the, after that, you can't beat a dead horse. Uh -huh. So that's just in terms of teaching. So, but I, uh, the bottom line is the high priority for the new building is number one, uh, classroom either regular classroom or lab classroom. Number two, research space. Anything else is outreach, et cetera, is way behind. Uh, the planetarium is used 20 to 25% of the usage, both time and numbers-wise, for, uh, for astronomy lab class, for part of the astronomy two-hour lab. So for about half of the weeks of the semester, they're down there for about half of the two hours, so it's 20, 25%. So that's my justification. All that they budget now is uh, 2600 2700 for the uh, maintenance contract it's going to 3350 we're trying to get them to adjust it we take in six or seven thousand a year I was 15,000 a year quarter time I agreed to go to 10,000 last year and without a, my department throwing in an extra 5,000 this year I'd be at 5,000 I love my job and I'm dedicated and it's a sticky situation but uh, pray hard yeah right so any questions I know it's a bullhorn here but Spits A3P, so 24 foot. They're going to they're going to raise the new building, though, you said. Oh, uh, at this point, the plans were to raise it and put up phase two there, but now they're not sure there's going to be a phase two. I would assume that if that happens, they'll renovate the existing building at the minimum, but nobody's talking about that. Okay, so are is there a chance where they get rid of the building and not rebuild, so you would be without a planetarium? No, I think at this point, I think the two options are number one, keep the building, but Pay, you know, the old building, but put some money into it. I don't know how much or how much they would put in the plan. Uh, one quick one here. I got that one question is going to surprise you or any, but uh, when Gordon Stewart uh, started this, 
the dean, interim dean, who thank God moved on out the Peter principal, she moved somewhere else uh, after two or three years. She number we had an ante room besides the planetarium. She turned that into a conference room. When that's not in use, we can take them in and out of our second door. Otherwise, they got to come in through my entrance, uh, what used to be the only entrance, but with the ante room in the second. She wanted the planetarium. She needed office space for for faculty, and she needed research space for faculty. So she got our ante room, it's now a conference room. We've still got the display case and posters on the wall, but we don't have globes and t-shirts and uh, racks and things out through the whole room. So we, uh, Gordon fought a battle, and uh, beca only because she moved on, the planetarium is still there right now. So it, it's been a battle now just to keep the doors open. Yeah, just to comment, I think our talks are together to illustrate so much depends on having the right people in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not entirely right. within our control. We're seeing the same. Dave Weinrich at the Moorhead State, Dale and I and Dave and some others, we were faculty with release time for the planet here. That was a funded 102 of general state funding. And now they've turned it into self-generating. and yes. all. They will give me the maintenance contract, uh, 1,800 in student help and 200 travel. This one is paid for by the foundation, but the state meetings, and that's it. They no, they no longer have any pouring of money into salary. Yeah, it's gone. We're, they're trying to make it sell. And seven or 8,000, my biggest income year ever. We were about six something last year. So it's, it's, a, it's a battle. And the first 5,000 has to go to salary. Right, thank you. All right, our last talk of this session is Nicholas Anderson. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, if you don't know me already, my name is Nick Anderson. I'm a recent graduate of Bowling Green State University, and I currently work at the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center as a planetarium uh, specialist there. And so if you're familiar with the planetariums at both those facilities, then you probably already know they both um, upgraded to full dome this past uh, summer. And so I'm just going to basically share my experience working those two planetariums and hopefully the observations kind of that I made will uh, help uh, ease the planning process for any planetariums that are sort of considering an upgrade or going through one right now. Um, so it was really neat. I actually got to be part of these two planetariums at different stages in the renovation process. So I got to see the initial stages, sort of the infrastructure and sort of the preparation at BG and then sort of we've been using the new system at Lake Erie, um, which has been really nice. And when you're going to be implementing this new technology, um, first of all, you need um, all these really detailed plans. Um, they need to cover all aspects of operation, and it's really important, as is having a major focus on collaboration. So we've had tons of staff discussions, and you constantly have to be reevaluating um, all circumstances. You know, what's working well, what's not, what do you need to change to improve upon those. Um, but first of all, before you do anything, you need to learn how to use the new technology. And it's a huge time investment. Um, it's challenging and rewarding, but once you get past that, you have a firm grasp on it, then you can start to worry about how to you know, come up with these methods for applying that technology to enhance education. Um, and that's really the main part of it. Um, and one of the things that I sort of realized um, in doing this with the new technology is that everybody on your staff is going to have different strengths and weaknesses, and so you really want to maximize using those. Um, so there's going to be those computer savvy people, those are going to be your programmers, um, they're really going to help out um, doing all the programming with the new technology. Um, and, but they have a really important job, and that's sort of helping out the people that might not catch on as fast. It's really not that easy for a lot of people, um, even myself. I, I know I needed help from a lot of the people that you know, knew it a lot better than I did. And another thing they really have to do is create a lot of these really extensive lists of sort of these customized shortcuts, whether you call them custom events, favorites, bookmarks. Um, it's a really huge time investment. Um, but once you have those, then you can trigger all these custom actions in a smooth, user-friendly way. So it's really worth it, but it takes a lot of time. <laughs> Um, but then there's going to be the people on the other end of the spectrum that are going to be the natural born presenters. And they have a really important job too. Presenters key. And even though we have this new technology, we still get a push from the visitors pushing for live interactive programs, which is good, I think. You know, it's nice to see that. Um, so you really want to you know, use these techniques um, to use the software in ways that really enhance education. You don't want to use it as a crutch. You want it to complement sort of the message that you're trying to convey. And I think that's really important, as is really being consistent. Um, even though everybody's going to have their own preferences, you want all your visitors coming through your planetarium to have sort of a similar experience no matter who's up there presenting. Um, so I know that's something we've really focused on. Um, but one of the things you need to worry about is presentation style. 
And so you can have pre-programmed, live, or typically usually a combination of the two. That's sort of what we've been doing. And even the pre-programmed shows can be done a lot of different ways, whether it's a simple sort of sequential kind of playlist or even more complex timeline editors. You know, there's a lot of ways you can do that. And sort of just playing around with those, figuring out what works best for you and for your different programs. Um, another thing that's really neat to look at is you, there might be compatible devices that you can use that hook up to your system um, that you can actually present from the front of the room, which is really important if there's only going to be one presenter in the room at a time, which is what we typically have. Um, so you don't have to run back and forth between the console all the time. You know, it's kind of frustrating when you have to do that. And so we actually have an iPad that lets us you know, run through commands in the front of the room and can actually move through space with an Xbox controller, which is really fun. The kids get a kick out of that when they get to see it you know, used in something else besides video games. Um, but besides that, there's a ton of adjustments you've got to make. Um, planning to convert all your shows. Some of them are going to be more straightforward than others. As we found in BG, if you're converting slide-based shows, there's a lot of effort um, that goes into that, converting them into these modern formats. Um, another thing that um, uh, you know, some plan terms are going to have to deal with is if you're going to have multiple projectors. Um, you know, BG kept their Minolta, and we upgraded from an A3P to a 512. Um, so you've got to determine when you're going to want to use those. Are you going to use them in the same show? If you are, which one are you going to use first? Um, it might take time to switch. We actually have to raise and lower both of our projectors if you want it. And that's going to take up time if you only have a certain amount of time allotted for each program. Um, but, y you know, you might have shows that you want just one of the projectors. So you need to think about that. Um, besides that, there's just a lot of other things like standard operating procedures, maintenance, updates, logging those updates so people know you've updated things, um, and just trying to find ways to train future operators, whether that's new people on your staff or even, you know, in the Science Center, let's say all of us go away for a Glipa conference can people run through your programs that don't really get exposed to the planetarium that often? Um, so it's nice to think about ways to do that, too. Um, but what's really nice is you don't have to be entirely self-sufficient. There's a ton of uh, sources out there for help. Um, one of the best ones is going to be the company representatives, all the vendors that we have here. I know we talked with Daniel from SCIS today, and he really helped. Even in half an hour, it really helps. Um, so they have all the knowledge and expertise, and they're really willing to help you at time of installation or follow-up visits. Um, it really, really helps. But also another really neat thing is that now that we're you know, in the technological era, you know, there's all these user groups online. And they're really uh, vital, too. Um, they're sort of these online communities of people that all have the same software. And so people can go on there. If you're having troubles, you can post about it. People can post solutions to those issues. And then they can also share a lot of downloadable content that you can share and use through domes that have the same system throughout the world, which is really neat. But one of the best ways I think you can actually prepare for renovation is through these training institutes. So I was able, you know, when I was in BG, to actually go to the Spitz Summer Institute in Philadelphia um, a few summers ago. And these programs are well-structured, they're hands-on, they take a step-by-step -step approach. So it's really a nice way to sort of ease into it. Um, there's different degrees of difficulty. So if you've never been exposed to this before, it's a great learning experience. But even if you've had the system for a few years, you know, there's always something more you can learn. So it's beneficial for everybody. Um, they introduce you to every single thing. <laughs> possible um, with these astronomy, with the new astronomy softwares, whether it's simulation, automation, multimedia editing, they really cover it all. Um, and they also have really great demonstrations that kind of show you ways to incorporate this new technology to reinforce education in your domes, too. Um, besides that, just like LIPA conferences, uh, another really just nice benefit about them is that they also function as social, social, social gatherings. Um, so you can have a lot of great, really great networking opportunities there, and with people that actually have the same systems as you, too. So it's kind of a a really great thing about that. And they're always sort of uh, you know, listening to feedback, too, to try to improve the quality of these workshops and sessions like that for all their attendees. Um, so overall, um, planetarium renovations are really exciting events to be a part of. I've had a great time you know, working in these, seeing these uh, planetariums you know, completely change. Um, but it can be really overwhelming at times. You know, it's a lot really fast, um, not a lot of time. So you really need a lot of thought and consideration um, to put into it. Um, because there's so much planning involved. But luckily, there's tons of ways out there to get support for training and uh, to just help you out all along the way. So, any questions? Are you totally at light here now? Yeah. yeah so I've been there since May. We, we reopened in May, and so it's been really fun. Yeah. Katie's right there. She's another one of the operators. <laughs> At Lake Erie, uh, you, you said you have an upgraded Spitz mm -hmm. and Uniview. Are you using Uniview as your playback software for full dome shows as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're doing that. But it's really neat using both and trying to figure out ways when you want to use it. It's kind of really cool having both. Um, I like that. So, um, yeah. Did you feel like the training you got from Spitz 
Smith and the Summer Institute was enough for you to go ahead and start running right away? That's what I was going to say, because I'm actually, they train you on Starry Night, things like that there, um, which we don't use now in the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. But what's really great is that if you get exposure to any one of those sort of programs, it's going to help you along the way. So I think Univue was a lot easier to adapt to because I had experience with Starry Night. So I think even if you end up using a different system later on, there's always, you know, there's always benefits um, to going to institutes like that. Oh yeah, it was a great time. I like Philly too. I had a, I had a blast out there. Thanks so much. That concludes this paper. And this microphone. <laughs> that concludes this paper session, I believe. On our schedules, it's time for our break with right. vendors. Is that right? Yep. It's an hour and a half. One thirty to three. And you all have to come back here. I'm talking to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.